Hello, hello everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for coming. I'm Stephen Pitty. I'm a professor of history and American studies and ethnicity, race and migration, and the director of the Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. It's great to see everyone here today on election day. Hope you all, those of you who can, have voted. Um, really, really thrilled to welcome back to campus uh, Monica Munoz Martinez. Uh, the Stanley J. Bernstein Assistant Professor of American Studies at Brown University. Uh, Monica was named last year an Andrew Carnegie Fellow as one of, quote, the country's most creative thinkers undertaking, quote, research on challenges to democracy and international order. A major honor and a, certainly a fitting one given the work that she does. Uh, Monica received her PhD in American Studies here at Yale. And at Brown, she offers courses on Latinx studies, immigration, histories of violence, histories of policing, and public memory in United States history. Her remarkable first book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, Anti-Mexican Violence in the United States, uh, was just published by Harvard University Press in September of 2018. Recommend it to all of you. There are a number of students in the room who already had the chance to read it and she'll be discussing that project here today. Uh, Monica Martinez is also the primary investigator for Mapping Violence, a digital project at Brown that documents histories of racial violence in Texas. She's also a founding member, member of the nonprofit organization Refusing to Forget, uh, uh, an organization that calls for a public reckoning with racial violence in Texas. That team developed an award-winning uh, uh, exhibit for the Bullock Te Texas State History Museum that marked the first time uh, in Texas history that a cultural institution acknowledged uh, Texas's state responsibility for a period of racial terror in the, or in the 20th century. Monica has also helped uh, to secure state historical markers along the US-Mexico border uh, commemorating racial violence in Texas and that has kept her very busy. Indeed, up until just hours ago, you were busy with this, with a ceremonial unveiling and other types of work. Please join me in, help, in welcoming Monica Martinez back to Yale. Thank you, Steve. I'm so happy to be here with you in New Haven. Happy uh, voting election day. I, um, I had another outfit planned for today uh, from Joe's Bakery. It was a t-shirt called Eat Tacos and Vote. Um, and I had a fabulous uh, crushed blue velvet blazer that I bought several years ago and never had a reason to wear it. Um, and then Oprah stole my look. She wore it before I did. And I called my mom and she said, well, you can't, you know, who wore it best with Oprah, Monica. <laughs> so, so instead of wearing a skirt that I bought, you know, like when I was on the job market, um, but if I, I wanted to dress for the occasion for the day, but also for coming back to New Haven and to Yale University and to be with faculty and colleagues that helped, to help me write this book um, and planted the seeds, not only for the Injustice Never Leaves You, but also um, for the public work and that helped me develop a praxis. And it also feels in many ways like I'm having the opportunity to continue a conversation and to help think through some questions that I still have about the best way to make histories of racial violence public. I've had, um, as Steve was saying, an opportunity to present my work um, in different communities in Texas and across the country, but also to participate in um, public projects. And I still have questions about, you know, what, how the responsible ways for bringing these histories to the public and for um, engaging different communities in conversations about uh, histories of racial violence and how to connect truthfully with the past. So I'm so thankful for the invitation to come back. Um, I'm also honored to participate in celebrating 20 years of ethnicity, race, and migration at Yale. And I'm so thankful to the faculty and the students in this room that helped to make it possible to organize and mobilize to, to, to build and dream of the center. It's really inspiring. And I'm uh, so thankful also for Nandi for, for the work that she did to help bring me here. So I'm going to do my best to stay still for the camera. Um, and. Uh, and, and share a bit with you from the book. I um, want to give 
you know, a quick overview of just some of the interventions uh, that the book makes and that I think has, has helped lead to um, the reception, the good reception that the book has received. Um, so to give people just a, 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 a broader sense of the interventions, I'll actually read a section of the book to help introduce some of the, a, a quick case study and to also give people a sense of the methods and the questions that I engage in the book. And then after that, um, I'm gonna talk through some of the, the problems and challenges with actually bringing about a public reckoning and dialogue about this history of racial violence. Um, so I also, can I get a sense of how many people in the room have read the book? It was a good number, okay. And how many of you know nothing about history of anti-Mexican violence in Texas? Okay. All right, so we've got a range of audience. I just wanted to get a sense. So just very broadly, my book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, grapples with a period of anti-Mexican violence in Texas in the early 20th century. It was a period between 1910 and 1920 that was a, a reign of terror, state-sanctioned. Uh, it was a, 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 a reign of terror enacted by um, a coalition of Texas Rangers, the state police officers in Texas, uh, local law enforcement officers, Anglo vigilantes, and US soldiers. And so striking the parallels that I see from 100 years ago and today in terms of the culture of anti-Mexican violence. So in the early 20th century, there was a um, politicians, the media, and local residents criminalized ethnic Mexicans as bandits, as threats to the nation, as threats to Anglos more specifically, and also as threats to Anglo capital, capitalism. And so you saw a period of, um, in which there were calls to increase the police presence on the border. Uh, in 1914, uh, the government responded by sending over 100,000 US troops to the border. And so, you know, the, the criminalization of ethnic Mexicans in this period uh, was answered by the brutal policing of this intersecting regime of law enforcement officers, soldiers, and, and Anglo vigilantes. And the, one of the tensions in the book is that in this period, um, there was an effort to justify the violence, and that led to uh, uh, public understandings of this period, in this period of of anti-Mexican violence actually being progress. And so one of the tensions in the book is that on the one hand, um, there have been calls for over 100 years by people who live in the borderlands, people from this era, uh, who sought justice and from generation to generation passed down an effort to try um, to change public understandings of this period of racial violence. Um, but that's in tension with a broad national forgetting of this this period of anti-Mexican violence. And so it's estimated that between 1910 and 1920 that hundreds of ethnic Mexicans were murdered by these agents. And that those victims included American citizens of Mexican descent, people that were racialized as Mexican, as foreign others, as criminal threats, and Mexican nationals that were living in Texas during this period. And so a good number of the people that had moved into South Texas in this period uh, were refugees fleeing the violence of the Mexican Revolution. And so in this period, um, most people publicly have forgotten this, these calls for violence and this period of, of racial terror. Um, and, and one of the interventions that I make in the book is not only to document the kinds of violence, the widespread violence, but, but also uh, to document the ways in which this kind of violence was institutionalized. And so for, his, for historians of the borderlands, um, other historians that have written about this period of violence, there's a long tradition of historians starting from the early 20th century with Walter Prescott Webb that really uh, created and institutionalized, not only in the field of history, but also in public history, a progress narrative. Um, that, that Mexicans were a violent group of people, um, that they are racially inferior, that they have uh, dirty water, trough water uh, for blood, um, and that Texas Ranger, brutality at the hands of Texas Rangers, the state police officers, was actually progress. You know, it made, it secured the border for Anglo capital and for Anglo Americans. Um, 
but one of the ways in which I think that the borderlands historians that have returned to this period to actually expose the brutality and expose the murders of people, the denial of due process uh, for ethnic Mexicans in this region is that historians have also fallen into this trap of looking at this period as ending in 1920. And so in, in 1919, uh, J.T. Canales, who was a state representative from Brownsville, he helped to lead an investigation into the Texas Rangers. And so the, the, some of the acts of brutality had become so uh, egregious, uh, namely the Bordenid Massacre in January 1918. It was the, the massacre of 15 men and boys who were in the custody of Texas Rangers. Um, it, this community was interrupted by a, a group of Texas Rangers, local ranching family, local ranchers, and uh, they were supported by a U.S. cavalry troop. Um, and in the middle of the night, uh, this community was awoken, taken from their homes, and this group of 15 men and boys was executed. And so that event caused uh, sort of put a spotlight on the kinds of brutality that had been occurring over the decade. Um, and in 1919, there was an investigation to the Texas Rangers, which led to weeks of, of investigations. Um, but as a result of the crimes that were brought to light from that investigation, uh, the Texas Ranger force was reduced in number. So part of the, the escalation of policing in this period took the form of the, the Texas State Police Force growing dramatically from under less than 100 uh, Texas Rangers in 1914. By 1919, there was um, 1,350 Texas Rangers, approximately. And so one of the ways that the state responded to the, the, this, these kinds of acts of brutality being exposed was to reduce the numbers of the Texas Rangers drastically. And so they reduced the force from over 1,300 uh, to less than 75. And so even for historians that have returned to this period to recover this period of, of violence, they've sort of understood the Canales investigation as leading to the end, the decline of this kind of brutality. Um, and so part of the work that I've done is to uh, trace the movement of some of these Texas Rangers and police officers to track the kinds of violence that they participated in different parts of the state, um, but also to note that, and to highlight quite clearly, that firing somebody from the Texas Ranger police force is not justice for murder. And that in fact, the Texas Rangers, some of the most, vi with, the, with the bloodiest records, were released from the force just before the investigation began. And so there were crimes that were documented that were never heard before the committee. Um, but in, in many cases, like the Texas Rangers that participated in the Bodvanid massacre, um, some of them that were released went on to become you know, sheriffs to work in local law enforcement. Um, and some of them actually returned back to the Texas Ranger Force years later. And so I've tried to, in this project, uh, expose the, the longer roots of, of this period of violence and how it shaped institutions of policing and cultures of policing and to raise um, concerns about the periodization of this period of violence ending in, in, in 1920. Um, and that's, you know, one of the other parts of this project was to also show the ways in which policing culture shapes uh, societies more broadly. And so in understandings of racial violence in U.S. history, most often people think about mob violence. And so, you know, think about lynchings. And in the history in Texas, there's not only a deep history of lynching, so the NAACP ranked Texas third in the nation for having the highest numbers of lynchings, just, be, just behind Georgia and Mississippi for the numbers of anti-black lynchings. Um, in Texas, between 18, 1848 and 1928, Texans lynched over 200 ethnic Mexicans. And so there is a deep culture of mob violence, but some of the work that I do is to actually show the ways in which the police themselves were agents of racial terror, practicing extra legal forms of violence and targeting multiple racial and ethnic groups. And so one of the, the projects that I developed after I left Yale was to, to study uh, the role of the Texas Rangers in intimidating NAACP chapters across the state um, and participating in mob violence by leaving prisoners unarmed. And so part of the work too is trying to expose how these histories of racial violence are deeply interconnected. And in a place like Texas, you can map 
how the state is acting to uh, create this reign of terror. Uh, but for too long, violence at the hands of police has been shielded in a cloak of legal authority. And in large part, that's because of the reliance of some tech of early historians like Walter Prescott Webb um, on the use of Texas Ranger records and seeing what Rangers were producing as truth. And so um, I, I want to read, so I'll do a little a, a reading from the book uh, before moving on to to two other points about the, the interventions of the book. And so I open with, uh, for people who are not from Texas, uh, a scene from Brownsville at the southernmost point of the state. Brownsville borders Matamoros, you can see it there. And here's a picture from Robert Runyon's collection, uh, an aerial photograph of the US-Mexico border in the 19 teens. Uh, the community on the south, uh, uh, south, just south of the border is Matamoros and north is Brownsville, and so you get the sense of how intimately connected these communities were. People uh, would live on one side of the river and own a business on the other side. People moved fluidly, and so the calls to militarize the border in this era really was trying to create a divide between communities, and so that was something that new Anglo settlers uh, that arrived in South Texas in the early 20th century wanted to, to create a, 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 an international border that felt like a division um, rather than just a river. So, I opened the book with a story of Florencio Garcia. It was an otherwise ordinary day in early April 1918, but Miguel Garcia, a Mexican national living in Texas, was growing concerned. His son Florencio, 25 years old, had not yet returned home from his job as a cattle herder in Cameron County. Garcia started walking through town, asking relatives, friends, neighbors, and eventually even the county attorney and local law enforcement officers if they had seen Florencio. Days passed without news. Then someone told Garcia that Texas Rangers had arrested Florencio over a week earlier, on April 5th, just south of Brownsville. Garcia knew that when ethnic Mexicans disappeared after being arrested, the prisoners' remains were often found hidden in the grove of mesquite trees in the rural Texas landscape. This grim news prompted Garcia to start searching the brush in the countryside for his son's remains. Miguel Garcia repeatedly asked for help from local authorities. Oscar Dancy, the Cameron County attorney, remembered Garcia's persistence. The old man, the father of the boy was at my office. He was at my office two or three times, and my residence once. Weeks later, local residents found human remains outside of Brownsville. Dancy remembered, we found the bones of a human being. We found a pair of pants and a jumper, and as I recollect it, a shirt, black hair, and a hat, a light Texas cowboy Stetson hat. And he added that there were bullet holes noticed in the jacket, two, perhaps three. The clothing matched the description Miguel Garcia had previously provided, and the investigation suggested that, but, that the body had been shot in the back three times. The remains consisted only of clothes, a skull with a tuft of hair, and bones scattered as far as 300 yards, likely by coyotes or buzzards. Garcia arrived at the scene and identified the shoes, hat, and clothing as belonging to Florencio. The father pulled a monographed handkerchief out of the jacket they had discovered and verified that it was his son's. So the story of Miguel Garcia looking for his father, I decided to, to, to write about this to open the book uh, for a few reasons. What ended up playing out, what I ended up finding in the archives, thanks to the investigations by the Mexican consulate that investigated this case, uh, was that there were witnesses to Florencio being in the custody of the state police. Uh, there were witnesses that found him, that saw him being held in a jail, a county jail. Um, and then there were witnesses that saw him leaving the county jail in the custody of Texas Rangers. And so from this account, uh, Miguel Garcia pressured local authorities to investigate the murder of his son. 
and he also pressured local authorities to offer a, to, to write a death certificate for his son. And so this became crucially important in the archives for me being able to tell the history, not only of the father's efforts, of the family's efforts, but to find a document that, that confirmed that Florencio Garcia died. And so this is an important find. You know, it includes information, biographical information about Florencio, uh, his date of birth, for example, his occupation as a cattle herder, the birthplace, his birthplace, but also the names of his parents. We don't have here access to the name of his wife, um, but we have information about who testified and, and identified the body. It was Miguel Garcia. We also have information here about the date of his burial. So we know that his family did bury the remains of Florencio. Um, but we also see an interesting uh, note here where the coroner actually had to amend the document. And so he had to amend the primary source because of the conditions under which the body was found. And so he didn't have information about when he died. Uh, he didn't have information, you know, he couldn't say the last I saw him or her alive was on this date. And so he actually, uh, you know, scratched through the text on the form and said that I attended, that I found the identified remains and the death occurred on unknown date. And so it was this interesting moment in the archives where you see that this body, that the, the remains of Florencio is literally falling out of the ways in which a coroner would traditionally write one of these documents. Um, and of course here, it must have been unsettling for the family to see that the cause of death was unknown, especially given that they found and the investigation found that there were bullet holes in the back of the jacket. But because the remains had been so far decomposed, um, the coroner, I'm guessing, is one of the reasons that they used to not uh, include that, that the cause of death was you know, being shot uh, or murdered. But uh, one of the reasons why this document is also so important um, is that there, it directly contrasts and undermines the efforts by the Texas Rangers that participated in arresting Florencio and that had been identified as having him in his custody when he was last seen alive. Uh, they actually wrote uh, and testified that they had released Florencio that they caused him no harm and that actually that he had been seen across the border in Matamoros and that perhaps he just didn't want, he wanted to abandon his family. Um, and, and so despite this death certificate being written, despite Florencio being buried by his family, um, there's not only, the, the, the Texas Rangers continued to deny any involvement in his death. Um, but with this death certificate in hand, Florencio Garcia's family was able to have the three Texas Rangers arrested. They were released on bond and placed back in the custody of their, you know, the supervision of the captain that they worked under. Um, and a, a grand jury decided not to indict the Texas Rangers. And so there's no prosecution of the Texas Rangers, um, but we do have this death certificate. And for the, you know, the estimates that hundreds of ethnic Mexicans died in this period is an estimate because part of the acts of violence was that there was no uh, consistent effort to record the deaths. And so we have access to the writings of journalists who wrote articles about these deaths. We have access to some of these rare documents, like these death certificates, uh, access to Mexican consulate records. So in this case, because Florencio was a Mexican national, the Mexican consul could be involved in calling for an investigation. And in large part, that's what led to at least the arrest of the Texas Rangers and the pressure to have this death certificate issued. Um, but of course, the grand jury uh, was not under the control of the Mexican consul or the requests of the father. And so um, there's no prosecution of the Texas Rangers here. And the, the effort to um, undermine the pleas and the calls for justice that we see not only in the effort, the, you know, the several attempts of Miguel Garcia to go and ask the county attorney for help in finding his son, and then asking for the death certificates to be issued, then calling for the arrest of his son, we see that all disavowed by the state, by the Texas Ranger uh, Captain Stevens, who testified in the Canales investigation in 1919. And he, in his report, um, disputed uh, that Florencio Garcia 
even died. And so here we see in the questions, did you interrogate the men and investigate the facts? And did you decide in your own mind whether or not they had anything to do with the death if he is dead? He's being interviewed here by the attorneys representing the state. And Stevens replies, I investigated the statements they made and I went to Brownsville and I heard through a Mexican that this man was seen across the river. After they turned him loose? Yes, after they turned him loose. I spoke to Deputy Sheriff who made the investigation. He stated that he did not think that this was the body of Garcia, that those bones had been there quite a long time. Right? So again, they're, they're also disputing the, the identification of the son's remains. You don't, know that Florencio Gar oh, you don't know that Florencio Garcia had a reputation of being a notorious cow thief on the other side of the river. I heard this after the investigation and that there was cooperation with the authorities. And so, you know, the, the investigation goes on. Um, but in this document, we see that Florencio Garcia is still, they're still denying that he died. They're still denying the identification of him. Um, and you also see the criminalization of the dead, right? And do you know, and you don't know, right, that he was uh, a notorious cow thief. So this pattern in 1918 uh, gives us just a glimpse into the, to the, to the other cases. In this case, we actually have a name of the victim, but there's many others that we don't have the names of. Um, and so this, was, uh, this case and others are important for also putting on display and exposing the ways in which the state authorities participated in justifying violence, covering crimes, and criminalizing the dead. Um, and that is something that in, and even in the, the, the public, you know, mainstream accounts of this period that celebrated violence or that justified or mitigated the violence, um, they, they often cast blame on rogue agents. And so the work that I did in the, in the book is also to expose the roles of governors, U.S. congressmen that called for violence and said things like Congressman Hudspeth said, you know, I will lead a mob against them those bandits. You've got to shoot them when you see them, right? So this is also the namesake of Hudspeth County in West Texas. And so who also then went on in 1924 to write into legislation a $1 million writer to the uh, Immigration Act of 1924 to build the Border Patrol, right? So uh, Kelly Lytle and Nandes has done excellent work in tracing the roots of the, the development of the Border Patrol um, being, in, being built by former Texas Rangers, um, but, but men like Hudspeth, who called for violence and justified even mob violence, uh, imagined a federal force built in like of the Texas Rangers. So, um, so enough about the state. <laughs> uh, the other sort of key departure in my book is, think, is, is really utilizing feminist research methods. Um, and so the, in the period of the examinations of this violence, um, the work before had primarily focused on conflict between men, Anglo men and Mexican men. Um, and the work that I did, you know, being really inspired by uh, my training in gender and sexuality studies um, and women and gender studies, but also in, in um, critical analysis of the work of women and mothers in calling out injustice in Latin America. Uh, throughout the 20th century and most recently in the 1980s and 90s and, and through today, um, I was really captivated by what it meant to study uh, and document as a historian what it was like to live in a reign of terror. Um, and so that requires that we examine the aftermath. Um, and, and a lot of the, the good foundational work in Borderlands history has contributed to collecting the names of people who died, you know, a body count. Um, but if we think about uh, trying to get a glimpse into how terror shaped daily life, it requires us to ask what happened after uh, Florencio Garcia was buried. And in that case, I don't have any more information into where the family moved, where they left, but other signal cases that I selected for the book uh, give us access to the longer legacy uh, that these acts of violence had in shaping generations of families but also shaping communities for over a century. Uh, and this is also building on the work like other historians like Kadada Williams, uh, who insist that historians have to do more than just study the violence events of racial violence. Um, so in, in this has, has helped to really center the work of women 
and also provide a gendered understanding of these kind, the, the, the dynamics of racial violence. And, and what I found was that in erasing or forgetting what happened in the aftermath of violence, uh, we have foreclosed the possibilities of exposing the methods that were available for seeking justice for the surviving relatives. So finding, you know, having, uh, pushing for an investigation, pushing for a, a death certificate. But I also found the work of widows and children who filed legislation, you know, lawsuits against the U.S. government, um, namely Mexican nationals that sought uh, uh, to hold the state accountable for the murder of their husbands or their children. Um, and so, you know, this was really an important legal archive to stumble into um, because it gave us access to what happens for Mexican nationals, what were the possibilities when local courts failed to prosecute. Um, and so in some cases, there were families who did receive indemnities from the U.S. government uh, for either the failure of, of, of the state to prosecute mob participants or for the direct involvement of U.S. soldiers or law enforcement agents like the Texas Rangers in the murder of their children. Um, but, you know, I also was really attentive to the, the burden that these families had to carry in testifying repeatedly throughout the investigations to Mexican consuls, to U.S. consuls, to county officials, um, and, 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 and thinking through the, the dynamics of having to attend to the violence of, on the body um, in an effort to seek justice. And so that introduced me to um, not just uh, the work of women in, 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 in seeking justice immediately in the aftermath, but it also introduced me to families who had been connected uh, by this period of violence by a broadly felt injustice. And so it was an injustice, not just from learning the histories and learning about the violence, the, the violent acts themselves, learning that people weren't prosecuted um, in this period of violence, but also learning that this period of violence had been disavowed by the state or erased or silenced or celebrated. And so thinking about um, injustice here, in a, in, in, it's multifaceted. So it's in the injustice of, of, of what took place in the 19 teens, but then it's also the continued um, injustices that these families carried. And so one person uh, described this to me as Norma Longoria Rodriguez is a, one of the leading Texas residents who I interviewed about the double murder of her grandfather and great-grandfather, Jesus Pazan and Antonio Longoria. They were murdered by a posse of a Texas Ranger and two civilians, um, Paul West and William Sterling. William Sterling went on later to lead the Texas Ranger force. Um, but in, 19, in September 1915, uh, her grandfather and great-grandfather visited a Texas Ranger uh, camp in South Texas in Hidalgo County and to report that they had been robbed. And so they wanted to report that they had had sto horses stolen. In the case that the people that stole these horses were later arrested, uh, the family didn't want these horses in the custody of these men to then uh, bring suspicion of them supporting banditry. And in this era, even being suspected or just called su being suspected of bandit, uh, banditry or, or, or sympathizing with bandits was a license to kill. Um, and so on the way home, Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria, you know, it's reported, witnesses later reported that they, you know, mounted their horses to return back to their ranch. Um, and when they had reached about 300 yards away from the ranger campsite, uh, these three men loaded into a Model T Ford, uh, drove to the men and shot them both in the back. So part of the devastating history of this account uh, was not only the brutality of the, the cold-blooded murder, um, but that also that, Carrie, that Texas Ranger Captain Harry Ransom uh, ordered the witnesses, the laborers on the ranch, not to bury the remains, not to tend to the remains, but also not to bury the remains. And so this was an, an extreme act of, of disrespect um, and intimidation. Um, and so, you know, a few days passed before fi uh, friends of Bazan and Longoria took the risk and actually buried the remains. Um, but when Norma Longoria Rodriguez learned of this story, it really interrupted her life. And it filled her with a sense of grief 
it, and it left her with unanswered questions. So she turned to history. Uh, she visited local libraries to read history books about this period of violence. She wanted to, when she heard that a Texas Ranger had participated, it disrupted all of her understandings of the Rangers. You know, these were the Lone Ranger and Chuck Norris, uh, the heroes that she had grown up um, idolizing in school. And so she went to the history books to try to learn more about this period of vi violence. Um, and she found some books, uh, but for the most part, she had more questions. And so she also tried to turn to local archives, uh, state archives. She went to Austin to look at the Texas Ranger reports. Um, she read through microfilm of local newspapers trying to find some discussion of this case, and she didn't find anything. She didn't find a death certificate for Jesus Bazan and Arturo Longoria. And so, um, despite dedicating weekends and vacations to searching state archives for public records, she didn't find these records. And so, instead, she took on the task of documenting her family history. And so, I actually found Norma Longoria Rodriguez, Steve Pitty. Uh, in the middle of my dissertation research supported me an email uh, because she had published an essay called Silence of the Heart, which gave a history of her grandmothers her, and her great-grandmother, Epigmenia Bazan and Antonia Longoria, uh, that had to live in the wake of violence. And so th she wrote a, a, a history of her grandmother and great-grandmother and gave an account of the double murder, and she published it in a local, in a, in, a, in a digital publication called Somos Primos. And so, you know, I visited her, I inter get, conducted an oral history with her um, for about two hours, and then she brought out a piece of, you know, I thought the interview was done, so I was packing up my stuff, and then she brings out a piece of pie and some iced tea, and then she brings out photographs, and then she brings out pictures. Oh, that's the same thing. She brings out. <laughs> photographs <laughs> and maps and a teaching certificate uh, of Antonio Longoria's and a letter that describes him as the Hidalgo County Commissioner. And so she started to bring me documents that proved that the two men had lived. And she showed me photographs of the gravestones. And then she brought out documents that gave me access to who her grandmother and great-grandmother were. And she told me stories about Antonia Longoria, who she referred to as Mama Toncha, you know, her grandmother, um, told me about the baked goods that she made, told me about how they leased out land. Um, and just this weekend, I learned about a grove of peach trees that they had on the ranch that died after the, the, after the double murder because the, the family couldn't sustain all of the work um, on the ranch. But when I asked her, about this work and the sentiments of loss that had remained, she explained, it's an injustice. It never leaves you. It's inherited loss. And the title of the book, The Injustice Never Leaves You, comes from that interview. Um, and it's inspired by the questions that Norma Longoria Rodriguez prompted me to ask that other historians had not prompted me to ask, right? Historians are objective. You stay removed. This is not the field of history, of, of emotions. Um, and one of the unanswered questions that has stayed with me um, is that she uh, wished that she had had the opportunity to ask one of the witnesses before they passed if her grandfather and great-grandfather died quickly. Did they have a fast death? Or did they suffer? You know, and that is such a human question. You know, she connected intimately with this grandfather and great-grandfather who she never knew, and more than just wanting to know the who, what, where, when, and why, what were the motives, who were the Texas Rangers, when did it happen, she was really lingering in those last moments with, when, when, the, when Captain Ranson ordered people not to tend to the bodies, were they alive, you know? Those are the questions that she has, and those are the questions that she's continued to ask, but also she's been committed to um, making the history public. And I remember sitting in Joan Meyerowitz's office in HGS and talking about Norma Longoria Rodriguez and the Alvarados that I had met and saying these, they are a part of this history. The history did not end in 1918 when the massacre happened. Um, and and you know, they were making history, they were writing their own history. And so this is, you know, some coming from the archive of Norma Longoria Rodriguez, this is a photograph of Jesus Bazan, 
you know, this was on display in the Bullock Museum. The Bullock Museum pulls from archives like the Library of Congress, the Autry Museum in LA, uh, the Texas State Archives, but they didn't know Jesus Bazan and they didn't have a picture of him. And they also didn't have this stunning photograph of Epigmenia Bazan. Here she is. And her granddaughters. This is Eloisa, you know, surrounded by the plants and with the bird in the corner. I just love this photograph, you know. And if I could be this, if I could just pose like that all the time. Um, but this was this was a photograph that that uh, Christine Cudi, oh, excuse me, Christine Melise, her mother Melba Cudi, had in their home that they donated uh, or lent to the Bullock Museum to have on display. Um, and they also uh, had this photograph of Antonio Longoria and Antonia Longoria. And the inscription on the back is really beautiful. It's written to their friends, who they call their brothers, right? You know, um, uh, the familial connection here. And so this was taken in 1895. And so these are the kinds of, 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 of documents that the families had preserved. They had participated in preserving an archive and pulling together a collection of documents. Um, but she also participated in writing history. The vernacular history making um, is the concept that you know, I pulled from, it was Joanne. She said, it's vernacular history making. So <laughs> there it is, it's in the book. But, uh, so she published a piece most recently in La Voz de Esperanza, it comes out of the Esperanza Center um, in San Antonio, Texas. And so she wrote a, 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 a lyrical ofrenda to her cousin, um, and his name is Ricardo Martinez, and he helped to, to, to restore um, the homestead of Antonio Longoria and, and, and Antonia Longoria. Um, and so the, the oral histories that, Anto that Norma Longoria Rodriguez helped to record um, of the accounts of the children that were in the house the day that these men came to, to take horses, um, he's preserved, for example, like the same window that they looked out of and described in their oral histories is, is still in the home that he's preserved. So this is the kind of uh, vernacular history making that I write about in the book as being an important political, uh, an important historical contribution, um, but also speaking back to the tradition that celebrates the Texas Rangers or that celebrates this period of racial violence. Um, but that's a tall task. Um, because, you know, we also remember that Walter Prescott Webb wrote, hit, published his first, you know, canonical account of the Texas Rangers in 1935 when he described um, indigenous people as savages and Mexicans as, you know, having dirty water for blood. Um, and that became inscribed in, in Texas history um, and he, because he helped to build public history in Texas. And so the book coming out in 1935 uh, was influential in the celebrations of the Texas centennial in Texas. So Texans celebrate Texas independence. And so in 1936, uh, he helped to install over a thousand monuments across the state of Texas and uh, to inspire exhibitions at the Texas Centennial like the, uh, you know, the Junior Rangers with the pledge, like a good ranger, I'll be brave, honest, obedient, and always keep my eyes out uh, for danger. Um, and so this is actually a pledge that students, that young generations can still take. Uh, it's sponsored by the Texas Ranger History Museum in Waco, Texas. Um, but of course, you know, generations have also been brought up watching the Lone Ranger and Walker, Texas Ranger. Um, and so the work of, of, of that the families and descendants have had to take on in trying to commemorate these histories of racial violence are speaking back to uh, myths that have been ingrained um, in public understandings of the past. And so I, uh, a little bit lost for time because I don't have a clock. What time? Okay, so here we go. So I'm gonna wrap up just by showing, okay, so then there's also the baseball, Texas Rangers. I don't know if you mean Rangers fans. Um, I mean, yeah, so there's, there's that guy, there's Bush. But then there's this, I have another one. I wish that I had one with, um, with, his, with his mother, with uh, the former first lady, because it's really charming, actually. She looks really cute <laughs> in a baseball cap. But, but this is also the Waco, Waco Texas Ranger History Museum. And I, I write a review of the, of the museum in my book um, and I was saying earlier that I thought, you know, after I was reading it, like, wow, that was really tough. Um, and then I visited the museum again just a week ago, and I found even more that uh, I 
could have really amped it up, actually, I think. Um, there's a lot of work that we have to do in, in, in having a truthful accounting of the past, encouraging cultural institutions across the state to participate in a truthful accounting of the past. And um, there are some institutions, you know, not just this, but across the state um, that actually have very, that have racist depictions of the past. Um, and I don't use that word lightly. Um, but, you know, in working with descendants of racial violence, and, and this group that I helped to start called Refusing to Forget, we started organizing in 2013 to pull together public commemorations because we recognized that despite the dozens of books that documented this period of racial violence, it, those academic, the, 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 the progress that we had made in professional conversations and understandings of history had not changed public understandings of the past. Um, and so we were thinking about having, you know, an exhibit at UT Austin, at the center, you know, sponsored by the Center for Mexican American Studies. Um, and we were thinking of raising funds for one monument or marker, some sort of statue, um, an artist installation. Um, and when we talked to people like Norma Longoria, when we had our first organizing meeting, I invited descendants like Norma Longoria Rodriguez and the Alvarados, who are descendants of the Podvnir massacre, and they very adamantly said, and what is the state going to do? So the peak of violence occurred in 2015. We had been planning for 2015, and they said, and what is the state going to do? Because we have been memorializing these histories on our own. We have been documenting them on our own. We have our own events. What is it going to take for the state to finally acknowledge its role in this period of violence? And so it shifted our whole, uh, or all of our strategies. And so uh, we utilized the Undertold Marker program in Texas, which is um, actually a, a phenomenal program. Since 2006, they have unveiled over 100 markers across the state. Uh, that tell undertold histories of Texas. And so what it does is it creates an opportunity for anybody in Texas and any historian to submit an application for an undertold marker. And it does not require a county to, to nominate, to, to sponsor the application. And so in some of the cases of episodes of racial violence that I have documented, the counties are opposed to having a marker like this. Um, and so when you submit it directly to the state, the state can approve or disapprove the application. I actually had to apply for this one three times, but we just unveiled it on Saturday. And so it was tremendous. Um, we had 175 people attended the unveiling ceremony. Um, we had descendants participated. We had a blessing um, and, and it was incredible, but we had like a three day public history extravaganza. And so we had a conference that day, uh, and this is here Melba Cudi and Norma Longoria Rodriguez and Ricardo Martinez, and they spoke about their own work preserving the history, how they learned the history, and then what they did to try to make it public. Um, and this is Christine Mulis, uh, Melba Cudi's daughter, who was really instrumental in getting the photographs on display in the Bullock, and that's me. And then uh, we also had a history harvest. We collaborated with UTRGV's special collections uh, to, to give a, a, a workshop to UTRGV students on how to digitize photographs, documents, um, and how to conduct oral histories. And so that was my part. And we also, in terms of the spirit of collaboration, uh, this is uh, Valerie Ramirez, and she's a member of the Hidalgo County Historical Commission. And so the, we had support from local universities, from the, the archivists, from the students, but also from the local county historical commission. And in this case, the county historical commission was really supportive, but they also um, are not always tech savvy. So, you know, figuring out how to fill out the application in the PDF. Um, they also had a president of the, the a chairman who was hospitalized. Um, and so, you know, this is all volunteer. And so this was, ended up being a tremendous opportunity for collaboration. And so um, I'm hopeful about the future and possibilities for making public change um, through engaged public history work. But I'm also uh, painfully aware of the climate of this work. So most people know about Hidalgo County or places like McAllen because of it was ground zero of family separation. 
Um, in every county where we are unveiling historical markers, there are multiple detention centers for immigrants. You know, I wrote in the epilogue of the book, also makes direct parallels between the families um, like Miguel Garcia, who were literally searching the landscape for the remains of his son, and families today who are doing that same work. And so uh, I'll just speed through here. Um, but, you know, Golibri, this is a center for human rights, um, and I am gripped by uh, the roles of families, you know, who are again preserving the names of their loved ones who've disappeared when crossing into the United States, who are calling on the state to remember the names and the faces of their loved ones. Um, and, and, you know, the, over 6,000 people have died since 1994, and deterrence policies funneled people seeking refuge in the United States through uh, the desert in Arizona and through the treacherous parts um, in Texas. And so literally in some, the same counties in Texas where loved ones were 100 years ago looking for the remains of their husbands and children and, and daughters, um, families are doing the same work of trying to identify the remains of people who have died. And so, um, so I'll stop there to answer any questions that people have about the public work, the history itself, the recovery work, um, and, and, and look forward to, to a good conversation. Sure, I can feel questions. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, there's a microphone. Yeah. So you were asking about vernacular history making? The politics of memory. The politics of memory. Yeah, and I'm really curious how, and was hoping you could reflect on like your graduate training. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, unfortunately, there are still a good number of historians that are skeptical of oral history. So, you know, I intentionally put that section in, in the book, in the introduction about the possibilities of oral history. I mean, you know, we have known the possibilities for decades. <laughs> um, but I also thought that, you know, people who maybe are not historians might read this book. And there's always a sort of quick dismissal of oral history as evidence. And so I'm really interested not only in studying memory and in and, and, and conflicting memories. So the first chapter looks at the, the lynching of Antonio Rodriguez. And really, there are no family members in that town. Um, he's, you know, he, he is burned alive at the stake in November in 1910. And he is understood to have just been passing through town or have been a, a migrant laborer. So he didn't have roots there. But that lynching continued to shape uh, um, the racial politics and society in the town for over 100 years. And so there are these competing accounts. You know, was it justice in action? Did he really murder Effie Greer Henderson? Um, or was he just a proxy? And was it really somebody else? And was it actually a brutal, brutal, immoral act of mob violence? And so those tensions coalesce in the town, and they don't fall along racial lines. And so that was something interesting that I wanted to point out in the book, um, that there are competing memories, and they do different work. And so the circulation of 
an account of the lynching by civil rights activists in the 60s and 70s, for example, animated a particular kind of organizing, right? That, that, that young Chicanos and Chicanas were imagining themselves as responding to long histories of violence and discrimination, right? And so sharing that story helped to mobilize a certain kind of awakening or consciousness. Um, and in another, in another context, sharing that account uh, warned a, a Mexican sheep shearer not to have relations with white women, right? That even proximity to white women is dangerous. And so I was interested in what kind of, like when did people decide to share the story and what was the lessons that were being conveyed? But also how is it that 100 years later people were still remembering this event? But then I also, as a historian, you know, for people who think that, you know, memory is, you know, not serious work, um, interested in, in using oral histories for what they expose in, in archives. And so for the, for the Bornid massacre, for example, if I hadn't conducted the oral history with the Alvarados, I would not have found the court case that was filed by the widows in 1926. And so 12 survivors of that massacre filed a claim against the US government, which led me to other cases of Mexican nationals that had filed cases against the US government seeking indemnities. And so it led me to a legal archive that historians hadn't found. And so, so part of the work, so there's the, stud, the, the study of memory itself, and then there's the use of oral histories that point you to archives that haven't been analyzed. And, and again, thinking about the work of Norma Longoria Rodriguez to prompt me to ask different questions. And so I think that the work and the importance of oral history is multiple. And it, it just takes, you know, if you uh, pull together the right committee that understand the politics of the questions, you know, so I was taking classes with Alicia, you know, who was thinking about how is it that people seek justice in the face of negligence by the state, right? Um, I was thinking about Las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo for example, and that what is the work that women were doing just showing up publicly to mourn? And so that helped me ask new questions as well. Um, but it also helped me engage, you know, just questions of what does it mean to take on the question of what is loss? What does it mean to, to analyze loss? And so I really was working with historians and people in cultural studies and building this interdisciplinary project, but I had a committee that understood the politics of the work and the urgency of the questions. And so I think part of it is finding the right methods and articulating the methods that help you answer the questions that feel urgent to you. And sometimes it maybe just means pulling together the right group of people. You know, Joanne Meyerowitz, from what I know, unless she's, you know, had this whole other life before, wasn't studying the borderlands, but she could understand having a, a feminist praxis for our doing archival work. Um, and so I think it's, I, w I had this really excellent synergy with my committee. Mm -hmm. But it's an important question. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you, Professor Martinez. Uh, my name is David, and I'm actually from Brownsville, so this is all very relevant from, to my upbringing. Uh, but I'm, I'm aware of how Brownsville and South Texas are now, as demographic-wise, but what does Brownsville and South Texas look like in 1910 and 1920 when this violence is happening? What's sort of the distribution of the demographics? Is it, uh, what I, I suppose, what percentage of uh, Mexican immigrants are there living in these areas? Ooh, the question of percentages. I'll have to send have you the either. numbers of that because I don't have it offhand, but in terms of the, 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 the demographics are changing. So you really have, by 1904, um, uh, the railroad arrives in Brownsville, and it brings with it Anglo migrants, you know, Anglos who are coming from the south and who are coming from the north who are bringing in new ideas about race and racial hierarchies. And so there had been a longer effort to, dis to, to remove um, a, a, a Mexican land-owning community, but also Mexican residents, many who were American citizens who were also engaged in politics and in voting, um, who were engaged in educating their children. And so you have this, what was introduced as historians call the Juan Crow, bringing Juan Crow laws of racial segregation to South Texas. And so that included segregating children from schools, uh, prohibiting interracial marriages, um, uh, 
you know, banning ethnic Mexicans from participating in juries, um, and also using racial intimidation for disenfranchisement. Um, also think, passing things like poll taxes. And, and so there was this effort really to create this new racial hierarchy. Um, and when laws and implementing laws weren't uh, as effective, especially in trying to displace landowners, then racial violence was used. And so you, the, the, the common phrase in this era was, you don't buy from the husband, you buy from the widow, right? So you murder the husband, and then you intimidate the widow, and you then take land that way. But there's what's, what's happening, uh, in terms of the shifting uh, economy is that this, this migration of Anglos changes the way that land is used. And so Texas changes from a um, primarily ranching economy in South Texas to a farming economy. So it's also been described by David Montejano as the farm colonization of the Southwest. And so you, um, so you see the, the change in, in, in the use of land, but also Mexicans uh, move from being um, a, a landed, you know, landed members of the landed elite to primarily being uh, wage laborers. And so um, it's a shifting of the racial hierarchies. Now, of course, it's important to remember that this is, there are layered histories of colonization, right? So Antonio Longoria, for example, has his land and can be traced back to a Spanish land grant, right? So, so there are histories of colonization that and and the patterns of policing that targeted different racial and ethnic groups right uh you know some of the texas rangers that are in this hall of fame uh are celebrated for participating in massacre and genocide of of, of indigenous people in texas some of them are also celebrated for being slave catchers i mean i'm not exaggerating they describe people as slave catchers and promote that in their bios of some of these texas rangers and so so it is a it is a place where the history of of genocidal colonization and the history of slavery and the history of US empire and nation building are all colliding. And in the early 20th century, you see these tensions being targeted at, at, at ethnic Mexicans. It's a complicated era, but if the numbers, I'll have to send them to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh -huh. Hello, thank you so much. Um, my name is Fernando. Um, I loved your book. Could you please speak to the the section on Dairy Queen? I just thought it was so phenomenal how it's such a public space, and yet like the way that you unpack the history and how photographs there have normalized violence. Um, just what that experience was for you, seeing that as you were working through this project, um, as you were writing it as well. Mm -hmm. And then also um, a broader question just about capitalism and how it, influenced um like is, is this could it be conceptualized this work as like a history of capitalism as um postcards are printed with like people like dying or dead on the postcards how does violence become um a form in which capitalism grows or is perpetuated mm -hmm. Okay, those are great questions. Well, I mean, to talk about the Dairy Queen briefly, you know, it, it was an eerie experience. So, I, you know, I was driving home to see my family in Uvalde because I had been doing archival work, and then I stopped in a Dairy Queen, which is, you know, on these road trips, you need to go to the bathroom and you need some iced tea. And so Sabinal is, um, is not too, you know, maybe 20 miles from where my, my parents live in Uvalde. But they, um, but anyhow, so there was a, a Texas Ranger, ex a photographic exhibit honoring the Texas Rangers. And so it included um, photographs of a lynching. And so it was this uh, moment I had been conducting his archival work on the history of anti-Mexican violence. Um, and this was one of those other moments, you know, talking to Norma Longoria Rodriguez and having pie with her was one of these moments. Um, talking to the Alvarados in Uvalde about the Bolvenid massacre and hearing about the conversations where they had talked to the local county about having historical marker and been dismissed, you know, or traveling to archives and seeing, you know, archivists pull documents out of the folders that they requested. You know, there were these other moments where I, I thought that the need to study oral history is also about studying the politics of how history is produced and who, what, who it's serving and who is committed to protecting a version of history. How is power, memory, and history all uh, coalescing? Um, so this, exhibit, this Dairy Queen exhibit with this, this lynching, these lynching photographs for me is a really profound example of um, the kind of racial intimidation that people are exposed to. 
right? So for people who identify with victims of racial violence who say that might look like me or that reminds me of somebody from my family who was treated that way, you know, that is the kind of image that reminds you of what your place is. Right? Um, there's, but they're similar. It's not you know, a lynching photograph, but also you know, the, the wrought iron signs across the state. You know, it's like Texas you know, kitsch. You know, we don't call 911, and it's got you know, the, a, a Colt 44 revolver. You know, it, it's like metal work, and people put them on their homes, and shops have po you know, posters that say, like, we, we don't call the police, we prosecute shoplifters, and it's got you know, people on a, a scaffold before being hanged. And so these kinds of images, um, I was really struck by not only the way that it had been curated, because there were no captions, you didn't get the sense of, you know, this could have been in Sabinal, it could have been anywhere, we didn't know who the victims were, um, but the way, the kind of work that it was doing, um, and talking to the women that worked there, saying things like, I don't like to take out the trash because I don't want to look at those photographs, um, but also that the person who curated the exhibit was so happy to talk about the Texas Rangers, right? So he was part of uh, creating uh, reenactment groups and celebrating this era of Texas Rangers in particular um, from like the, you know, the 1880s through the 19 teens. And so it was also then an experience to try to, 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 to give space for thinking through um, what is the interest in somebody in these reenactment groups in creating these, the celebration and being a part of participating in vernacular history making, you know, not to dismantle these mainstream narratives, but to reinforce them. And especially in rural communities where people don't have access to cultural institutions, right? The Dairy Queen is what you do, you know, it's where old men drink coffee. And so I was really interested in how these politics play out in ways. I mean, it's racism in plain sight. Right, so people think about monuments, Confederate monuments coming down, um, but this is uh, another history that is just celebrate without because people, because most people don't know this history, um, or they do and they really do think that this is progress. Right, they really do think that Native Americans in this era were savage, and so for them this is they're honoring uh, Texans that helped to build the state. So that's interesting. You had a second question though. Yeah, about like. Like, can your book be told like in oh. like a history of capitalism in te Texas? Um, I think so. I mean, certainly, if you, I mean, if you're thinking about the commodification of, I mean, the ways in which racial violence was also used to suppress uh, union organizing, labor organizing, and also to intimidate a vulnerable labor force. Certainly, I mean, there's a long history of Texas Rangers and Border Patrol uh, being used to uh, suppress, you know efforts for labor rights, um, or also just to, you know, deport laborers uh, before payday. So there's, a, there's the, inter the history of policing is deeply interconnected with the exploitation of labor um, and the recruitment of vulnerable labor um, and then the exploitation of that labor. But, um, but in the terms of the commodification of the postcards, Certainly, it's a, it, there's a history, uh, you know, the history of photography in this era. You know, there's the, the use of, uh, I describe it as the convergence of, um, you know, wartime photography, you know, the photographers that are taking photographs of the Mexican Revolution, but also um, of the development of this, you know, the, 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 the sell of these postcards as souvenirs, right? So it's a way that you create um, not only a market that celebrates, uh, this kind of dehumanization in photography, um, but you also see the wider circulation of the criminalization of Mexicans. And so you see the figure of the Mexican bandit um, taking root in Texas, but then also change, creating a national figure of the menacing Mexican that we are still living with today. So this was not just the postcards, but also the political cartoons. And, you know, in another version, you know, when I've given talks to, to bigger pu public audiences, you know, I show some of those political cartoons, right? It's this, it's this moment when you see the crystallization of, of Mexicans as bandit, as foreigner, as threat um, being cemented. Oh, there's two. So maybe you both ask, and then, and then I'll combine them really quickly. Thank you. Okay, so um, my name is Larissa. Thank you for your talk. I mean, I think this is really important work. Um, but um, 
Yeah, so I guess my question is like, where do we go from here? Like, I think it's really interesting that you chose Texas and, and then what like this, I just think it's sort of ironic considering like Texas is also like, the like produces textbooks and, and it's like a lot of, yeah, it's like missing so much information. And so I guess, I don't know, what, what, what role do you think that books like yours can play in like teaching more of the community and like how do we make those things also like accessible because mm -hmm. I know a lot of times like academic papers are written for people like Other. in academia and so it's yeah like sometimes it's really hard to then go back to like for example rural communities and try to just be like no actually all that they taught you was wrong so like how can you really have engaging dialogue where like people can start seeing yeah like seeing this without also I mean the history is really violent and mm -hmm. I can yeah, and also even like, how do you begin like teaching children? Like at what, like what ages, mm -hmm. but I don't know. Yeah, no, these questions. are really important questions. And these are some of the questions that I don't have all the answers for. But, you know, one of the things for refusing to forget that I, I started to do, you know, one of the things was to build a, um, yeah, quickly ask your question. We'll talk at dinner. Yeah. Okay, we have time. Okay, yeah. so really quickly though, but it was to write, Part of the public work for Refusing to Forget, you know, is I brought students on at Brown, um, a, a group of graduate students and undergraduate students, and we wrote a curriculum, four-day curriculum on Jovideidad, right? So again, how do you tell this, history, this brutal history of racial violence to children, which is not my, that's not my skill set. Um, but so we developed this lesson plan and it can be modular so that, you know, teachers can use different, different parts of it. Um, but it gives a history of this racial violence, a history of the Texas Rangers and the brutality, but it also gives the history of Jovi Taidad, right? Who not only was a journalist who literally stood in front of the Texas Rangers to try to keep them from burning down a printing press. They eventually burned it down. But before they did, you know, she also wrote these newspaper articles documenting the atrocities. She also organized for women's suffrage. She also organized for access to public schools by these Mexican children. Um, and she also helped build the first, you know, cross-border civil rights conference, El Primer Congreso Mexicanista. And she had, and she organized a women's conference alongside it. And so it was this conference that invited people from both sides of the border, right? Because in this era, there was not really a border. People moved fluidly back and forth. Um, and so she imagined civil rights organizing and a fight for social justice having to be a cross-border border coalition. And so bringing these sort of radical f calls for justice, bringing a figure like Jovi Teidad to a public audience, to an elementary school audience, to me was a really captivating opportunity. And it's something, um, you know, we matched it up so it, it fulfills the teaks, you know, knowing that every student in Texas and public schools has to take Texas history in K through 12. And if they're a university student, they have to take it again. That's a big group of students. Um, so making it fulfill the requirements that a teacher would need to teach that in a Texas history class. Now, you know, my parents walked out of schools in 1970 to protest discrimination and segregation in schools. And one of the things that they demanded was Mexican American studies be taught in public schools. And finally, in 2019, it's going to be offered by teachers and school districts that support it, but students can get state credit for taking Mexican American studies. And so I'm part of a group of historians that are just hustling to try to help develop curriculum. And so the um, Adelinda Valencia, who is a descendant of the Bolivar Massacre, has, all, has written some lesson plans uh, about the Bolivar Massacre. And so we are working really actively to figure out how you reach a younger audience. Um, I paired up with Professor Chris Garmona, who just wrote a book called El Rinche. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of fiction um, about this era, but it's for young adults. Right, so there are, and, and there's, a, there, so there's, that is an active effort. But I think that, um, you know, having the historical marker is one thing, having the book is one thing, but then how you actually activate the history to shape and change public understandings of the border and of immigration. Um, you know, my sister is an artist and she says, you know, the border, people know the border as a place of horror, but it's a, she knows it as a place of hope. So we need to get back there. Thank you. And actually, you answered the question. Uh, I was going to ask about the, as a fellow oral historian, the role that oral history allows um, academics to not only produce uh, academic research, but also 
lead into public history, right? And how that takes place that you use answer in. So thank yeah, you. I mean, I think part of it is that, that there's just, for me, I think that as a historian or people who study histories of racial violence, um, that once you have learned these histories and once you are starting to help document these histories for public for publication, for academic work, that we have a moral obligation to make sure that it's available to a wider public. And so, and I also felt a moral obligation for these families who had been working to try to make these histories public for over a hundred years to leverage my PhD to do some of that work, right? So, um, you know, and we've received a considerable amount of resistance most recently. Um, and I, I am still concerned. There's still a lot of good work that public history can do, and I'm very hopeful. Um, but I also now see um, that there is possibility for some of these efforts to create harm. And so for a descendant of the Bodmini massacre to read, uh, you know, local members of a county describe their family members as bandits and as rapists and to say, you know, awful things in public correspondence um, or to describe them as, you know, militant Hispanics. Um, I, you know, the, the progress that we have made is invaluable. Um, but again, it's about recognizing that the urgency for making this history public is because we are living in a violent context. Um, we are living in another era where troops are being sent to the border, where immigrants are being, where people who are seeking refuge, asylum seekers are being imprisoned, um, and, uh, and uh, where there is a rise of white supremacy and racial hate. And so in, in this era, we have had some very good luck finding partners and allies in the state to help have a truthful accounting and to show real leadership. But I am also seeing that now, as some of these events have become more public and we've received more attention, that, that there is now active, an active effort um, to stop the progress. And so in some cases, uh, it has exposed a, a, a troubling part of Texas. So, um, but I'm more determined than ever. So, you know, the book is out. There's nothing they can do about that. The marker is up. <laughs> There's nothing they can do about that. So, you know, determined to keep making more progress. Mm -hmm. Thank you.